I guess she'll log in later, but I want to tell her beforehand. <laughs> but I was telling Tamara, I just did a um interview on our other on Instagram with Stephanie. But that's what I was doing this morning, girl. Mm-hmm. Getting ready for that and doing some little work in my house and stuff. You know, just getting some stuff done yeah. for the holiday. Mm-hmm. Yes, I was stuff out of the list. Oh, uh, who else said they was coming? Oh, here. Let me see. Oh, yeah. Okay. A couple more people. Stephanie, she's still doing her lot, her um interview with somebody else, so she'll be in in a minute. And then I've got probably Massandra is here. I think couple more people, Crystal. Um, um, about one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. about five more people. I'm gonna give them a couple more minutes and then we can go ahead and start. I know it's our different little time zone at one o'clock. I mean, we got three. We at three o'clock, not one o'clock like we normally do. But um, I didn't know what time the interview with Stephanie was gonna be over with. That's why I said, let me just bump it up to three. So that's why I did it like that. But we really was only on for twelve thirty. But I didn't want to just jump right in. I said, let me get a break, and I had lay down for a second and stuff. So. Yeah. And, yeah, still early in the afternoon. Be on here for a minute, talk about this, and still enjoy the rest of y'all day. Everybody, show off work tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna go to Champagne and visit my sister tomorrow morning. Stay down there for a day, and then come on back tomorrow night. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. It's only about a couple hours away, not that far. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, girl. You finished reading the book, right, Michelle? I read uh the majority of it. I was okay. taking my time reading it. It's it's more of a um, you know, it's more of a, a um I didn't want to brush through it. I really just wanted to read it and you know have this as one of my toolbox things. I already mm-hmm. know. I already know about him, but yeah, I like right, that. Right. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I was uh, once you said you was gonna come on, I I had start back reading it. You know, I had kind of stopped. <laughs> you know, right? Because I know you was like, well, I ain't. We ain't discussing it. So <laughs> exactly. I'm gonna do it when I feel like it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because I sure wasn't gonna do it. I was like, no. Nah. Then I said, you very know, very important. I'm glad you did. I think it's mm-hmm. very yeah, because I couldn't figure out how I was gonna do it. Because I'm like, well, if we going out, you know, it's September. We got to move forward. We ain't stuck on that no more. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But then I had said, but then I had said, well, when we come on, like now we can discuss it. But I was like, no, nah, that's gonna be too quick. We need to have a real discussion. Yeah. So I said, you know what? We can just do it a week after book club because then it'll still be fresh on everybody's mind. You know what I'm saying? So, and mm-hmm. it gave people a little more time to read too if they did not read. You know, so it was right. good. Yeah. 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 So, I'm going to give them one more minute and then we're going to score. Okay. Seems like all the Zoom things, uh, uh, they want to charge them for a free trial. I ain't gonna do all that. All right, everybody doing all that. Everybody paying no money. Exactly. 
Hell, they always want to charge for stuff. Mm -mm. Mm. No, ma'am. Exactly. No, ma'am, no ham, no sauce. <laughs> Okay, three fifteen. Let's go. All right, so um, we are discussing the book "What Happened to You" by Oprah Winfrey and Doctor Bruce D. Perry. Um, I'm gonna just give you a quick overview of the book, real quick. Um, Oprah Winfrey and Doctor Bruce. Um, it's exploring what happened to us in early childhood influences the people that we become. Um, they challenge us to shift from focusing on what's wrong with you or why are you behaving this way to asking the question, what happened to you? And this is the question that people should be asking um, going forward. What happened to you? So my first question is, um, how many of you all ever heard of the uh, book before now? Were you all aware of the book that it was out? Have you all heard of it? Anything? Yeah, I had. I okay. had read it before, before the book was. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Tamara? Also, no. I want to introduce Tamara, too. She's actually a new member. Um, this is her first book club discussion. Um, she's one of my high school um, classmates. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so I'm happy that she's joined us. But, yeah, Tamara, have you heard of the book? Did you ever have to heard of the book before? I have not. Okay. All right. Yeah, so that's why I was asking, because I know some people heard of it. Some people hadn't, um, I believe, Michelle talked about it a while ago, or Diane, I believe, had mentioned it in one of our other discussions. She brought it up. Um, I had heard about it, uh, so I think we put it on the list, and I knew at some point we was going to get to it, so I was really happy when it was chosen for um, August, and that we made it um, a special Zoom today so that we can discuss this uh, important, important topic. Um, uh, my next question, I wanted to know when did you first start hearing about the word trauma? Meaning like um, as a topic conversation, not the actual word trauma, but more of a topic conversation. And when it became like well known to you about trauma, when did that, when did you start to hear about that? Anybody can go. Um, well, I'll go first. Um, I started hearing about it, I wanna say, um, when I was watching Oprah, I really want to be honest and say, I think I started hearing more about trauma and people, personal experiences while watching the Oprah Winfrey show. Um, she, you know, she's talked about trauma for the last 20, 30 years on her show. And during those years, I want to say probably in 2000, um, early 2000s, I started to dive in and listen to her conversations and her, um, sessions and, um, she talked a lot, of, a lot about different topics. And I think that's what draw, draw me to listening to Oprah because at first, you know, we was young. We didn't really listen to Oprah like that. But as we got older, um, she started tapping into a lot of different important issues that you really wasn't hearing from a lot of other people in their platforms. Um, they were telling their personal experience. It was raw. And they was just giving all the information, you know, and things that you were really surprised to hear people was dealing with going through. Um, it was a lot of sensitive topics. You know, like I said, people really wasn't discussing trauma back then like that. Um, but yeah, so anybody else want to go? When did you start hearing about trauma? The conversation piece as a topic? Yeah, it's been years since I've heard about it. Um, 15, 20 years ago since I of a topic of discussion, but it's been maybe within the past 10 years 
that I really started taking notice to the word and exactly what it means in regards to certain and different things. <sighs> okay. I'm walking, y'all. Okay. But uh, okay. it's interesting too because um, it's a real thing. Like when people talk about uh, PTSD, it was usually referred to for people in the military and to that people suffer all kinds of traumas in their lives and have uh, issues about it or regarding it. Yes, yes, definitely. That's when I, like I say, with trauma, I, I agree with you, LaFondra, on that because um, trauma back then was more of a big event, people from the from the um, war coming back home and, you know, just major traumatic experiences. You know, we always kind of looked at that as, as traumatic, but not so much um, the smaller, um, quieter, like she stated in the book, um, experiences. Um, anybody else want to go, Michelle, Pamela? I would say um, I first heard about trauma um, because I am a psychology major. You learn a lot about trauma um, studying psychology, <clears throat> but it wasn't until about maybe, I don't know, maybe 18 years or so ago, um, I was working in a children's program and a little girl, um, right now to this day, she have a developmental disability and it was because the trauma to the brain, her, her mother boyfriend shook her. And at that time, I didn't really understand the whole history behind it, but yeah. So that's how that all came out. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I can't even really tell you I've been in social work for probably 30 years. So I don't even remember exactly when, um, I actually heard the word. They've always kind of talked about it with the trauma informed, trauma, you know, care. So I don't, I can't even tell you when I heard it. It's just always been a buzzword and always been a word that's been around that even though it was a word that people were using, they still didn't know how to deal with people that had trauma. And so I think just hearing about it, we still didn't, it's not until probably fairly recent where now we're able to really dive in and work with people that have the trauma that we're kind of been talking about. Yes, yes. Um, like I say, it was different for me. You know, it wasn't nothing I learned or nothing like that. You know, I learned it from the media. Like I said, watch Oprah Winfrey. So, so you all had a different type of way of tapping into uh, trauma. You all learned it in school and of course your courses and all that stuff. So that was good too, which was many years ago. Um, I just wanted to, like I say, just touch and see when did people start to hear more about it? Because even in the book, they stated trauma wasn't talked about back in the day. And I thought it was um, surprising to hear like, man, Oprah been talking about this 30 years ago. You know, that's been so long ago, you know, and back in the 80s, or late 80s, like you said, people weren't really talking about it. It was more of a, if they were talking about it, it was more of a quiet uh, conversation, one-on-one. -on -one. You know, it wasn't as, um, I guess, put out there like it is now. You know, it's, it's just, it wasn't as popular like it is now. That word trauma is, now it's everywhere. Everybody's talking about it. You know, it takes us a while to kind of get on board with things, you know, or, or just, um, you know, talk about certain type of issues. And like I say, um, we we today, we are talking about more issues and reality issues that, that we're dealing with. And far as children, um, adults, we're talking about more sensitive topics now than we've ever had. And I'm definitely happy about that. Um, I've had conversations with my friends, you know, like I said, talking about things one-on-one -on -one over the phone, things like that. But, um, when Oprah came out with this book, I was happy about that because now we have some type of uh, guide to go by, you know what I mean? Um, I don't have any trauma books. You know, I'm sure you all, because you all went to school dealing with trauma, you all probably have books and all kind of um, 
things dealing with trauma, but this is my first trauma book, you know, at least as far as dealing with a doctor, having his intake on it, I would say that. Um, also, I wanted to acknowledge that Dr. Perry, he's, what, he's also from, he was um, in Chicago. He lived here for a while um, back in the day. I thought that was amazing. Like, wow, he was right on the south side. Okay, cool. I um, think he was at Loyola, too, where I went. That's how oh, I Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, he's actually a um, south, a child psychiatrist. Um, he studied the impact of stress, stress and trauma on development, and he's a neuro neuroscientist. Um, he studied the brain and stress stress response system. Um, and of course, we all know Oprah, so there's no introduction about her. Um, I don't really have a lot of questions today. I just really wanted to tap in and just you know pick out some things from the book um, that was relatable or we could talk about and discuss um, some important things from the book because there was so much information. Um, I'm going to probably have to buy another book because I don't mark this one all the way up. <laughs> so I think I'm about two books, um, but that'll be later on. But yeah, so um, we can start off with Oprah, how she was very transparent about her situation as a child growing up. Um, I'm not sure if everybody knew about a, thing, a lot of things that she spoke about, but I do remember hearing some things, um, her talking, of course, on her show about how she was abused as a child and some things she dealt with with her parents. Um, but in this book, she delved a lot more deeper into things that she was dealing with as a child. Um, she wanted to... Um, her, her main focus of having the Oprah Winfrey show, she wanted to brainstorm solutions in the issue of child abuse. So her whole, like I say, 30 years of um, learning about trauma and talking about it, that was her main focus a lot of times on her show, dealing with some type of abuse, all types of abuse, you know, um, and like I say, you know, she had the world listening to her, so everybody opened their minds and was dip, dip, actually listening to her, you know, um, she talked about abuse, she talked about neglect, um, and healing, that's the main focus also, healing with her, that was her entire career, her focus of those um, aspects. Um, but she also stated, you know, she experienced sexual, sexual abuse and regular beatings, um, which made her become a people pleaser. She spoke about that in the early part of the book. Um, so we can just talk about that for a minute, um, with Oprah. Were you all aware of the things she had dealt with as a child? Were you, or was that surprising to you or what? No, I'm very familiar with Oprah. I really watched her show and I liked her, you know, so, um, the thing she talked about in the book, I kind of was aware of, but I like how she was able to piece together certain things like that instance with her grandmother and her uncle and how she didn't really realize that, you know, how she was, you know, didn't feel safe, uh, at night. And how mm -hmm. she was able to make that connection. And sometimes when you make the connection, that's when you get that awareness, that is when you actually can move past certain things, when you get that awareness. And I feel like with her really getting that awareness, she like, oh, okay. So she can really tap into that piece and work mm -hmm. on that piece instead of just, I don't really know what's going on with me. Well, what's happening? So I, yeah. But yeah, I like yeah. how they kind of played off each other because she was like, more of the everyday person talking and he was you know he will give his uh more scientific more uh professional uh judgment and experiences so I liked how they kind of played off each other and showed it in different colors I think that was a great mm -hmm. one I don't know how it was in a book but yeah it was know. like that okay yeah it was like different colors and I, it's a great way to kind of like uh to bring people, you know, to bring it more uh, relatable. And that's why I like Dr. Perry books because he is, his books are more relatable where you can, it's an easy read. It's not so technical that you like, I don't know what the hell he talking about. So I exactly. Think, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, like I said, he talked about 
Bruce Perry back in the day. Hey, hey, let me tell you something. <laughs> Dr. Perry, yeah. that, that has been my jam. He has been, uh, I really want to work with him because I feel like he gets like, what he is talking about is so groundbreaking because it's so many people that sometimes, you know, just having interaction with people, just how this world is and having interactions. And we automatically sometimes go, what the fuck is wrong with them? Why, is, why are they suddenly snapping? And I just may have did something slight. So I think, you know, with you really finding out or figuring out about this brain, because the brain controls everything and just yes. bringing that aware oh my god I, I can talk about him all day let me stop <laughs> <laughs> what'd you say you were true yeah, I so I think, yeah i think he in houston now mm -hmm. uh I think his center is in houston so i was like you know what i might see if i can get an internship or something yeah yeah that would be really good if you can because, I mean, um, like I say, I've only heard you speak about him. I have not heard about him until the book. Um, <laughs> so I don't know anything about him. I know you did recommend another book that we was going to um, mm. read about. It was uh, The the, the, the Boy, the boy the Raised the Dog. dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I did put that on the um, book list. So hopefully we'll be reading that soon. And, um, you know, get some more information from him. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Somebody joined. Uh, yeah. I it's know. me. I was just waiting for you all to talk. This is Diane. Hey, don't. Oh, okay. okay. Diane. Hey, uh, hey, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. I thought it started at two. I was just on the phone with my sister. I said, oh, well, I missed it. No, no, no. It was three o'clock. I have to hold yeah, I thought it was two o'clock. Yeah, no, I, bust, I, I bumped it to three because I had an interview earlier today. But um, I was just asking, you know, uh, different questions about Oprah Winfrey. Had, when did you all hear about the book? Have, I know you had talked about it before. Um, talking about Bruce Perry, like, just how have you heard of the word trauma? Like, when did you start hearing about it? We can, you can de definitely answer that question, Diane. We can just kind of jump on in. When did you start hearing about the topic of trauma as a conversation piece? Um, I mean, I've been heard about it, but I was just, this was a couple years ago. I, um, I was having a conversation with one of my friends who's also a school teacher in the district that I teach in. And we was just talking about the, the youth today and like their behavior issues and level of disrespect and this, that, and the other. And I think one day I was like, what is, what is wrong with these kids? And then she, um, brought to my attention she told me about the the book um what happened to you she said you really need to read that book because that might clear up some of the things that you know you're wondering and she said I found it very interesting so when you get a chance so I kept saying I was going to listen to it or read it and then when I joined the book club as you know so I kept putting it in my you know request and so when <laughs> you finally um picked it I said thank god because this will force me to read it, I feel like if I picked it, um, and then we're doing it as a book club, it would force me to read it. So it took me, I list, I did the audio, but it took me a minute to do the audio because when I say I took notes, like I got like just tons of notes because I, um, you know, I work with the youth and I do mainly elementary and middle school. And I'm going to try to incorporate a lot of the things that they said this time around into, you know, my therapy. And the main thing that um, Dr. Perry was saying was, um, you know, we're always saying what is wrong with you. Start out just saying, like, what happened to you? You might get a better response. And that's even with adults, too. You know, it's like like Michelle was saying when I came on, will somebody just snap off? It's like... I mean, why are you acting like this? What's wrong with you when it's something more traumatic or something they just experienced that causes them to have that behavior? So I'm most definitely going to use a lot of the stuff that they suggested um, to use in my um, sessions with the youth and see how that actually works. Because I feel like, you know, sometimes with the kids, once they trust you, because the main thing he said, and I, I knew this anyways, is to build that relationship. Once you build that relationship and that trust, they will most definitely open up to you more. 
And so I feel like if I can get, you know, if it's just two-on-one or one-on-one and, you know, just start engaging in conversation, just say, you know, you would, you know, would you mind sharing like some of the things that what happened to you, you know, figure out how to word it and see mm -hmm. how much I can get. Um, Cause there's one young lady, I know she's suffering from all type of trauma um, at home. They're like homeless right now. They live in a shelter and all of that. And she barely speaks. And so I'm working with her and trying to get her to open up more. So I'm going to use a lot of those tactics. But yeah, trauma comes in different forms, though, you know? Yes, yes. Like I was just telling them um, before you came on that, you know, my take on trauma was it had to be something major. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I mean, major, you know, but now they say, like they said in the book, there's more... Um, obvious trauma like more quieter trauma that we don't really speak about like even just being humiliated or you mm -hmm. know um, things like that or shame yeah bullying. yes oh, yes mm -hmm. we won't we wouldn't normally think that's traumatic you know it gotta right. be something with a capital t you know but trauma also has a small t as well but it's still um it's still trauma however you look at it so right and exactly. that was our opener mm-hmm so like I said, I don't really have a lot of questions today. I just want to tap in on different parts of the book, you know, just pull out pieces and discuss, um, you know, as we go on. Mm -hmm. um, I know the first chapter was pretty much talking about making sense of the world and how they stated that more than 130 million babies are born every year. Okay, that's a lot of babies. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you don't think about babies having trauma you just don't think about that at least I don't you know you thinking babies come in the world the mother you know being loving the father maybe there maybe not but they're getting love no matter what but what they're saying is some babies are welcomed into the world and some are rejected and like I say we need to think about that as well you know uh it's not always a loving environment or a, a loving, um, welcoming time when a baby comes in the world. It's, they can definitely come in being born into trauma events and trauma um, experiences, which is also something to think about, you know. Um, Oprah stated as a child that she felt lonely a lot when she was a kid and that her mother and father, you know, they was together just one time and she was born, basically. You know, they got together one time you know, and how many times we know that can happen, you know, where people don't really know each other and then boom, here come a baby. You know, everybody don't have a relationship being together for 15 years or have a long, you know, it's just a one-time thing and boom, the mother get pregnant and you got to still, you know, take care of this baby. Um, and she also said that she knew she was unwanted in love as a child, you know, just how does that feel as kids? And it makes you think about other kids that also have the same feeling, but is unable to tell someone that or express that, but they have a sense of feeling unwanted and unloved as a child. Um, and um, I guess I wanted to just basically say that, you know, once again, she stated that early childhood experiences basically determine your outcome in life, you know, pretty much like it's so important. And we like I say, I don't really know. I don't really have kids. so I don't really think about them like that. I'm not in the um, psychiatry field. I'm not, you know, so this is just stuff that it brings back to my remembrance and to think about these things. It opened my eyes more to think about these topics. You know, and um, yeah, it just it just opened my eyes, you know, and make me uh, want to learn more about what's going on with a lot of children that are not being, um, you know, having that loving um, mother and father or whatever at that time of, you know, being born. Um, Another thing she also stated was that um, she said to look behind the behavior of an individual. We always just look at that person. And like you said, Diane, it's like, man, what's wrong? And why are you acting with that child? No, he bad. Oh, my God. He is like, you know, people say all kind of things and we don't realize how important 
how it affects the child at that time. We just saying stuff as adults, you know, but really what we're saying is effective to them, you know, um, like you stated, we all, that's, that's the main question that everybody have always said, what is wrong with that child? You know, something got to be wrong with him, you know, or we so quick to label that child, you know, oh my God, that child got some, uh, some type of ADD problem or something, you know, um, but yeah, like you said, no one really takes that time out, sit with that child, talk to that child and see what's really going on with them, you know? And, um, another thing she pointed out was just that the first couple of months is so important, which I didn't, you know, I didn't know that, you know, the timing of everything is what's important from birth up until even two months. You know, it's so important and it has an impact on your life. You know, um, did you all know that before she stated it about, had, do anybody, anybody heard, knew about that? How the importance of just being born from zero to two months, you know, or that's, that's like the most critical time is basically what she said of, um, of the child's life, you know? Um, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, I just was talking. <laughs> oh, okay. Go ahead, girl. Because I ain't heard nothing you said. Repeat what you said, girl. <laughs> I was like, yeah, uh, I I knew. I think um, you probably did know, Tanisha, but you probably didn't really think about it. You just think about when people say kids are like a sponge. That's what they mean. When they say kids learn so quickly, like babies, they pick up things so quickly. I think in common terms, that's what's kind of what it means where their brain is developing. So everything that comes to them is being penetrated. So that's what, yeah. So I was, I've always been familiar with that. I've always worked with kids. I used to work with um, first time moms and I really used to really hone in before I even knew about Dr. Perry. I used to talk about you know, just the development of the brain and just how how they should, you know, rear and kind of teach their kids when they're growing but, up and they're babies. But my thing is, when I look at a kid that's a month old, couple of days, I'm thinking they don't even know nothing. So whatever we doing ain't going to be no problem. You know what I'm saying? Because right. they can't even talk. They right. barely can sit up, you know? So right. I'm not really thinking that nothing is really they don't even about know where they at you know what i'm saying right, but yeah. she's basically saying from birth and really yeah. she said it from in the womb yeah it Most starts in the womb yeah their their brain is developing then you mm -hmm. know you know how much stuff we do when people pregnant and stuff i mean we still hanging out we still doing this you know ain't nobody really okay i'm pregnant let me let me read this book. Let me sing this song to my baby. I mean, you know what I'm saying? We still listen to our music. We doing whatever. I mean, they saying everything matters. You yeah, know, I, and that's, that's what I'm saying. actually put music on the their tummy when they were asleep. I mean, when they were pregnant. Like, I used to actually really try from before they even have the baby to start these type of uh, rituals and traditions of how you have to bring the baby in the world and that they absorb everything everything so yeah yeah and that's why they say sometimes it's important to read to them as well when they're in the womb you know that that helps develop the brain um as well and it just depends on i think they're like their environment as well what they're born into right away um because some kids you know like oprah said between when they're born to two months, they could be in a, even though you think because they're newborn, um, it wouldn't affect them, but they could be in hostile environments. Like if they were a parent that is constantly hollering all the time, that affects, you know, the kid, the baby. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah, that, that is just, it's just crazy, you know, and I think that's why I wanted to, have this discussion so that people you know would definitely be aware because a lot of stuff you know they don't and remember y'all remember they don't have no parent uh guidebook out here you yeah. know and i have always said 
that these parents, they're getting younger and younger. And they right. don't know nothing about what they're doing. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Um, and, and just, you know, think about when we were young, you know, they having babies at 14, 15, 16. They don't have a clue about the proper way to nurture a child. And their parents are not giving them that information. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes the parents don't even know. You know, they parents is 30 years old. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just, that we're just in a time where kids are birthing kids. You know, babies, yeah. babies, and babies, you know, is it, and you know, you just automatically supposed to just grow up just because you're pregnant. That ain't that ain't how it go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you ain't just they no had, adult because you're a baby. You right. pregnant, you I mean. have this um correlation with in regards to two babies, like two kids raised in the same home with the right. same parents. And one of the kids, it was one of the kids committed a heinous crime mm -hmm. and he could not understand so he had to go back and go back to how she actually uh from when they were kids in the crib like what was the difference and the difference was that when she had the first child she was around her family she had help she had a community when she had the second child they moved away so she literally did not realize that her, she left the baby in the crib all day while she took the oldest kid out to the park or to whatever, where this kid that was in the crib had to learn how to self-soothe. So she didn't really realize that you have to sh have interactions with babies. <laughs> like you said, when you have a baby, you got to have these interactions. You They got to have, you know, some type of contact and human connection for them to learn how to be able to self sue because initially they shouldn't be able to learn how to self sue They need the the human to kind of teach that. And so it was just funny how he just showed just the difference. Because sometimes you may look at how kids in the same household, like how are they so different? And that was a, 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 a real polar opposite. It was crazy, but um, but that was in his other book. But yeah, that was just um, just how, you know, just how kids are raised and just how not really knowing. And like you said, with these kids getting younger and younger, and we just sometimes assume you should know. You should know that. Like, you should know you should pick your kid up when they hungry, when they need to be fed, when they need to be changed. And if you're 14, you just, you might not have that thought process and to see when a child is hungry I should feed them when a child is wet I should change them but to you know most people don't be like like that's common sense but some right. may not have that common sense, sense. <laughs> <laughs> my pastor say common sense ain't always so common to everybody so yeah. right and and, we, and we're quick to say that I mean, that's just common sense. Like, come on now, who who, who would yeah. know that? Well, yeah. really, they apparently they didn't. Yeah. You know, so it's being more understanding. But now that I've listened to this book, it really, you know, makes me step back and starting to look at things in a different perspective. Like I have, you know, a friend now that's like a, a person that's just kind of combative. And now I'm thinking about when I listen to the book. You know, I wonder what happened to this person. I'm going to have to sit down and talk to them because something happened that I don't, you know, we never talked about because it now it's just really starting to make more, more and more sense. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think even when he talked about, oh. um, sorry, when he talked about, um, the kids that may have been triggered by that old spice. Like it's just even stuff like that, that you wouldn't even, you'd be like, dang, I didn't know that. like that's something that's just so small that you wouldn't even think that a kid will react off of. But like he said, with that brain part and just him talking about that lower part of the brain, uh -huh. we don't even have, we can't even go to that rational part. To me, that was just so profound because when you're at that lower part and you're just reactionary, you don't, you can't even think common, critical, none of that. So just seeing how you interact with people and when they're in that state, 
you can't talk to them rationally. You can't get to them because they're 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 now, like he said, they're in that fight or flight type of right. situation where they can't even go to that rational piece of their brain to say, let me calm down and have a conversation with her. If I keep going off, I might get in trouble. If I'm in school, I might get suspended or expelled. If I'm talking to a police officer, I might get arrested. I might go to jail. So it's like they can't even get to that part of the brain to bring themselves down, to think rational, to think of the consequences that may occur with this outburst. Right. Yeah. And that, and he was saying, like, you know, if you're angry and hostile all the time, you know, it, it comes from, the like you said, the lower part of the brain, which is like the cortex. So you can't even regulate, you know, get to the regulation because, again, you're so busy um like you say fight or flight off of just if you're always angry so mm -hmm. you have to try to figure out how to get to the higher part, top part of the brain in order to you know um form some type of regulation and right. that and you know once it, and i heard that i was like oh you know that makes sense and now that i start thinking about kids that i work with and i was like because you know you you be thinking like this kid just ain't gonna get it but they can't <laughs> get it Mm -mm. Because they can't get to the other part of the brain because they're so, you know, defiant. And so it's like, you know, now you got to try to figure out just ways to get them to calm down and relax so that you can move, you know, get um, from the lower part of the brain to the top part of the brain. And that's even in uh, adults, just people, I guess, in general, you yeah. know. Yeah, because um, when you said that about the regulation, like just it wasn't until I, I was in this uh internship where I was with a multidisciplinary team where I was able to work with multitudes of people. And so we really was uh trying to teach how to regulate the emotions and the behavior of uh -huh. people. And so just that piece where people, like even in the schools, they really have to, that's the piece that's missing, that they Absolutely. have to regulate the kids emotions and behaviors before you can get to the lesson because if they are anything now, else they can't they can't process anything else and and just it's just small things that you can do to get the kid to regulate mm -hmm. yeah small things yes okay. yes hi uh somebody just joined hey stephanie this is another new member Oh, okay. um, this is her first time having um, joining the book club as well as Tamara. So, hey, Stephanie. She's the one I did the interview with earlier today at noon. Okay. <laughs> so welcome, 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 ladies. All right. So, yeah, just jump on in whenever you have anything to talk about. We're just picking out things from the book that has, you know, stuck out to you or just going through the book and just picking out things that we can discuss from the book as well. Um, um, I just want to point out the evocative cues which I have never heard of you know which is a major um word that I have never even heard of like I didn't even think it was a thing you know but evocative cues it can activate traumatic memory you know um just little things like little triggers that you have um just like with the, the guy, I want to talk about the VA, uh, Mr. Rose Roseman. Um, they spoke about him being uh, coming home from the war and how, you know, he was um, the evocative cue from the, uh, the backfire of the, of the motorcycle. You know, he thought it was a gunshot. He having a date with his girlfriend and end up on the, on, in between the cars. You know, I know she was like, well, what the hell is wrong with him? You know? I mean, ain't nobody shooting, but his man went to straight, he back in war. You know what I'm saying? I got the hat, I got the duck, I got to stay alive. He went in combat mode, you know, trying to, well, I should say survival mode, you know? And, um, you know, I like how he took his, his girlfriend or wife, whatever, to the, to the therapy with him and said, doctor, can you tell us what's wrong with me? You know, <laughs> but he broke it down and told him, you know, it's not that, you, something's wrong with you. You just, like you stated before, we talked about the brain stem, you know, you just reacted, you know, from whatever past experience, because they stated that the, when, when you have a trigger, it comes, the, the past experience is what first connects to that trigger. 
And it, like you all stated, it takes a while to get to the cortex, which I didn't even know that. Because you know, baby, we ready to fire off it in a second. Somebody piss us off, we ready to go at it. You know what I'm saying? But they also stated, if you can just have a few minutes, you know, to just calm down, have a, just take some, a, a few minutes, a few moments of, of, of space and just think about what's going on and reflect so you can get back control of yourself, you know? So, um, and, and the funny thing he stated with the, um, the diagram that he used, he said he used that just one time in therapy and he's been using that for the next 30 years, the model of the brain. And I think that is so good because it helps you to understand, which I didn't know that, you know, there was even a brain stem that it had that we think from the bottom up, you know. So, um, do anything anybody have to talk about that? We were talking about that before you came, but Stephanie, did you have anything to say about the model of the brain or? Well, not necessarily the model of the brain, but the part about um, just understanding the need to tend to the child in in these ways prior to them being able to be taught. It's been like a part of the practice for me the last 20 years. Baby, how you doing? You know, just like tapping in with the child first. I didn't have the words for it. And I, I tell you, when I went in on Friday, I, I told my principal about, about the book. I was like, I think this should be our PD book. I'm not going to be on staff this year, but I'm like, I think we need to go back to this principle and really get on the same page having this lens because we have children that are in high need. And I'm like the whole first, well, the second and third chapter in particular, I'm like, yes, <laughs> this part yeah. is wrong. Mm -hmm. This child, this baby of ours, but what happened? What happened? We have a transfer school. This is, this is what we're dealing with, you know? Mm -hmm. We need to check our the our entry point and tend to some needs that have to be met before we expect any learning to be able to happen, period. So yeah, that's really been sitting with me since I started it. Thank you for asking. Yeah, yeah, definitely no problem. Thank you for that. Um, but yeah, um, I just wanted to also point out um, that they talked about anything new will activate our stress response. Now, we all know when we in a new environment, you know, you feel in a certain type of way, we just don't be comfortable, you know, and just the feeling of unsafe also activates our stress response as well. You know, a fear of um, a new environment, um, new people, you know, um, anything new, you know, whatever it is, whatever, whatever it may be, it, it, it activates our stress response. Um, and, you know, the unknown, you know, we always want to be what's around what's familiar, what's our norm, you know, um, because when we are around the unknown or um, it happens to, you know, we just happen to be somewhere where uh, something new happens or I guess an unknown experience, you know, God knows what it could be, but it causes us to feel anxious and overwhelmed as well. You know what I mean? So, and then he's, because he speaks about that fear, it shuts down our thinking and amps up our feeling, you know? And I was like, this is so true. You know what I mean? We scared, we, we trying to, you know, hide the cover. You know, we just, I mean, fear is, is no joke, you know? Um, another thing, we can speak about this. When the, when the, with the uh, police shootings, that's another thing. Um, when they're around black people, you know, they get them around, uh, they, they catch them in an act or whatever it may be, they feel threatened, they're fearful. That's why a lot of killings is happening today because they're not thinking first. They're going straight with, they on, they on attack mode. Their stress response is activated, you know? And they first thing they go to is boom, let me take out my gum and take them out. You know, they are not trying to, but, but once again, that's only with black people. You don't feel that way when it comes to the white people. You don't feel like that because and to them, white people, that's their norm. That's not unfamiliar zone. You know what I mean? That they're familiar with that. Black people, they're not familiar with because they're not around them like that. Black people is on the media as uh, they're, they're fugitive, you know, nothing but um, bad things are associated with black people. So you know, when another another person from a nationality is around us, they're fearful. 
I don't care who it is. It ain't just the whites. It's all the other nationalities because that's what's portrayed on the media. And that's where most people get their information from, not from books, but they get it from television, which is what the media. So I just wanted to talk about that. Um, I wanted to mention, because um, my sister is a police officer and I've always, um, like pretty much, I was, I've always said, I said, you guys need some type of simulation, some type of uh, training where that stress, I didn't, I didn't know how to put it into words until I read the book, but just, they need something where it could activate their stressors so they can learn how to manage it because they don't know how to manage it. They're no different than any other person. They're just, they just have the power to do as far as being having readily access to shoot somebody. So I think that's part of the, that this needs to be an overhaul with the police, with the police department where yes, they don't even realize that it's that they're at their lower part of their brain, that they're rash, that they're it's, it's the irrational part of their brain. They're just thinking of, I'm just trying to be safe. And, exactly. and even though, like, like you said, their interaction is through the media. So if what they're seeing is these different shows showing us hyped up, amped up with us having interactions, if you're not, that's not your norm, that's going to take you to a fight or flight type of situation. So that's something that they kind of, I've have always, I've, I've said it to her, I was like, Black people need to police black people. White people need to police white people. Mexicans need to police Mexican people because that's your culture. That's who you deal with. And that's who you should deal with because another black person may not come on that scene in that same situation where they're going to have that stress response. They're just going to be like, this mug is just talking and just amped up, but it's not going to automatically activate that part of their brain. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely. That is definitely a good, a good um, observation, I would think. Um, and if you can recommend your sister the book and bring it to her chief or the deputy or whoever. Okay. Yeah, okay. that would be definitely good. And like I say, um, you know, even even in schools and stuff, you talk, you all talked about that, the stress response. You know, they talked about how they so quick to expel the kids. You know, they go straight to up, oh, suspend it. You acting bad? Okay, that's it for you. Out of here. Bye. You know, see, did y'all try to get the br the baby some help? I mean, has anybody talked to him without going straight to the 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 protocols, the the guidelines? Uh, it, this is well, this is what happens, and this is the this is the result. Okay, this is what you do. Well, then this is what happens. Okay, wait a minute. These are children we're talking about here. They trying to learn just like everybody else. You know what I mean? They're babies. I mean, but they treat them, you know, but everybody is so want to go by the books. You know, that's what they want to do. No one wants to go deeper and, and figure out what's going on. That takes too much time. We ain't got time for all that. You know, you need to do that and go to a therapist. This is school. It's something different. No, it's all the same. You know what I mean? It's, it's an institution is what it is. You know, but um. That, oh, so sorry. No, no, no. Go. Go ahead. Anybody? Oh, I was gonna say I I see at the root of that that same fear response. So you know, like on the ground floor, it is it has been evident which teachers are actually afraid of our children. They're not seeing them as children at all, and they're entering the space from that place unknowingly unaware and it is playing out and so then the responses are those by the books because we're not even thinking we're not identifying a child in front of us it is a whole different thing that's playing out you know and I, and and it's not a, it's systemic and it's also I think attached to these narratives that we were already talking about it. and they're all playing in accordance with one another and I think this is like the shift in this book is I think an opportunity to interrupt that. Yes. You know. Yes. Yes. And it's a learning curve for everyone involved. Absolutely. This book is for everybody. I don't care how smart, how many degrees you got. 
Bro. I don't care about none of that. It's for everybody on every level need to definitely get their hands on this book because it will teach you how to handle children, even the children in your home. Yeah. If you messed up with the first one, okay, let's try to work on it with the second. You know what I mean? I mean, for real, because, you know, this book is, is, I mean, this is the piece right here. And the funny thing is this book was written during the pandemic, April 27, 2021. That was the best time to write this book. You know, get this stuff written, documented, you know what I'm saying? Stamped and get it out. Like I told them, I told them earlier, I'm buying two copies because I done marked the first one all the way up. <laughs> I need another one <laughs> that looked a little better than the first one. <laughs> but yeah, um, next point I wanted to discuss about how she stated remaining in a constant state of alertness can have a diversity effect on your health. Now, that's one thing I did not know, you know, how adversity can have an effect on your entire health, you know. Um, yeah. Diane, go ahead. Well, no. Well, um, what was I going to say? Actually, um, so this past Friday, there was a kid that, um, and I still don't know exactly what happened. I won't find out until this weekend. But he got angry at a teacher and he found a metal object and he stabbed the teacher. And so she had to go to, you know, she had to go to the hospital. So, you know, I, and those are the things that teachers are dealing with um, in the classrooms now because the kids have such, you know, just different type of behavior issues and impulsive behavior as well. And so, you know, a lot of times they try to go by the book and, um, you know, in theory. But again, I think this, just this particular book right here will really help break down some of those things and things, tools that they can use um, when, you know, when certain situations like that, you know, arise. But yeah, the teachers are now, they, they really are starting to fear for their lives. That's why a lot of teachers now are starting to resign and, and retire early because it really has gotten out of hand. And um, like someone said earlier, we really need to focus on regulation and um, working with this kid first before anything when it comes to teaching them anything, because they're not gonna learn anything if they're not regulated. Exactly, exactly. And this is new to me. I'm 45 years old. <laughs> I ain't know nothing about no regulate, no nothing. Okay. You know, yeah, well, we're dealing in different times, you know, we're different times yes. and dealing with, and, and yes. kids are just, even in their homes, a lot of it is coming from their experiences in their homes. So, you know, we got to start there too. Yep. Yep. They say this uh, regulation begins in the infancy, you know, when they're infants, you know, mm -hmm. you have to regulate them starting there. You know, and um, they talked about stress takes us out of balance and then we become dysregulated. So a lot of these children are dysregulated. And like you all said, if the parents are dysregulated, how the kids going to be regulated? You know what I mean? If it's starting from them, you know. Um, so it, it's, it's a, a two in one. Everybody got to play their part and do what needs to be done. You know, and like you say, it starts from your leaders. If you're in school, it starts from the teacher you're at home and start from the parents and so forth and so forth. Um, they talked a lot about um, how balance is the core of our health um, and how we need to stay in balance and how rhythm is, rhythm is essential to our healthy, to a healthy mind and body and how rhythm is a form of regulating. You know, um, I didn't know that. And actually I just started, you know, basically walking probably I think um it's been a couple of years now you know but I didn't know it was anything dealing with regulating and rhythm you know it was just something I wanted to do and I do enjoy it you know everybody got their own thing some people ride bikes some people go work out but all of that is still rhythm you know and it's still health um essential to your body um and uh they spoke about regulating um it's connected to having relationships forming and maintaining friendships and relationships. And then there's a reward afterwards, you know. Um, um, what else do they speak about? 
uh, oh, about the reward bucket, you know, how we should definitely fill our reward buckets um, every day, you know, whether whatever it may be, just have a reward bucket. It could be something different every single day. But the healthiest way they say to do this is through relationships and how connectedness regulates and rewards us all the time, you know, and um, I was just, we were just talking about that on Stephanie's um, platform about how being connected, and I was telling her how I went through a, a period where I was just didn't really want to be around people, you know, but you don't really, really realize how that affects your health, you know, and being around people, connecting with people on all levels, just going out, even if it's for a few minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, just whatever it may be, just go out, be around some people, go have a, go have a walk, go out and have a, a, a little dinner or snack or whatever it may be. Go visit a friend you ain't seen in a long time. You know, whatever it may be, being connected, it regulates us. And it is the key to maintaining a good, healthy life, you know, along with other things. But um, that's really one of the main focus. You know, um, did you all know that about being connected to people, how that affects your health? Yes, no, anybody? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. I guess I was the only one that was in the dark. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's Tanisha, you're behind. funny. I'll be thinking I know Lisa, a lot you of things, been, you but... You've been in the corporate world. That's why I, I think a lot of yeah. us has kind of been in human services, teaching, like, so that might be why we kind of like have some of the knowledge. <laughs> I've been in, uh, I've been doing this a long time. I used to be a, a work for a child welfare. So I've been in investigations. I've um taken children out, you know, um, uh, what's it called caseworker where I'm actually working the case trying to get the kids back to their bio mom so I've done you know I've worked with kids pretty much my whole career and so I'm used to a, a lot of things that I didn't have a knowledge like we who know that literally this is what we need to be teaching our foster parents that have these foster children so they can learn how like like the uh, like one of the stories she was in this story too. Mama, I can't remember her name. Mama, she had the she had the Mama uh, P. Mama, yeah, she had the mama. She was in the other story too. She had mm -hmm. the mama and she had the daughter, and just how she didn't have the knowledge of the brains and all that, but she knew how to nurture. And with her knowing how to nurture, she was able to bring that mom to be a better caretaker for her child, to make that child be able to rework the brain, rewire the brain to uh, be able to be more resilient. And so just that piece where we really, like a lot of the foster kids, they come into the system and they having all these problems. They have so many diagnoses that you don't even know which diagnosis is the real diagnosis because every time somebody touch them, they're going to diagnose them. And so with that, when they come into these foster homes, these foster parents know that they're getting a foster kid, but they don't have the tools most of the time to deal with these kids that may have these explosive outbursts and interactions where instead what they do, that kid got to go. That kid got to get out the house. So now we got to go through the cycle again where we got to deal with a kid. They got to go to a new place. But now down here in Texas, these kids they ain't even got nowhere to place. They literally are in what's called child watch. Where they or they keep them until they get a certain age mm -hmm. and then they give them back away. Yeah. Because by that time, when you when you ate and may have explosion explosive behavior versus when you 16 and have explosive behavior those are two different ways that you see because they 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 is and for sure at a 16 year old when they're explosive when it comes it's going to come to that foster care they're going to fight a flight so part of it is they don't even have the knowledge and skills the tools. to yeah. be able to deal with these kids that's in but there. not only 
that's that is true. I mean, I work for social services too. I've did it for many, many years. Um the we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Repeat that because you went out for an hour. Oh. I said that they don't really have the tools and the knowledge that they need to take on these kids sometimes. Um the fact that I have provided services, I have been a rescue worker, I have worked with um, kids that were taken away from their parents. Just, I mean, I have, like I said, I have been in social services for a very, very long time. And I have also worked the crisis line where I get all the calls for abuse and neglect and all of that type of stuff. And a lot of it goes back to having the knowledge, the tools, um, the right training, even understanding a kid. Sometimes we place kids with people that they shouldn't even be placed with because you don't even know the trauma that the foster parents have been through. And then you take on these kids and they come with their own package, their own issues. And then you have the nerves to take on a kid and you tell them, oh, you're going to be just like, you know, it's, it's, it's so deep. It's just really, really deep. Yeah. So that's why I, when I when I read this book, I was like, wow, I needed this book a long time ago. Not not just with work, but even my personal life. Some things that uh, my oldest son said to me that I wasn't even aware of. And I think it has something to do with my upbringing. You know, you don't realize. And sometimes they'll say, well, you say things like, um, that's it. Don't say nothing back. It's, it's just the book brought so many issues, even to my own personal life. It was so scary. I was like, wow, some of these I'm dealing with my own demons reading this book. Yeah. I felt the exact same way, the exact same way. I was like, oh my God, if I had had these words, like to be able to explain to myself what I was experiencing. I knew I identified it in the children I served, right? But I didn't always have the words for it. It's like this made sense of what I knew in here, kind of like a me, right? I was like, see, yeah, this, this part and imagining a world where our generation or the generation before the generation before had an understanding to communicate and to build community in that had this understanding, you know, I don't know. I, 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 that's where it took me. I was just like, wow. If, if my mama had known, if my, my grandfather had known, if our folks had known, but now we're knowing. So then there's hope in a different way too. I, this book was so deep and powerful for me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, and you was. know, and that's where Dr. Perry also said, you know, it doesn't take, I mean, it I mean, you have to have knowledge of, but it also takes just a community of people and to build that trust when it comes to, to the youth and, and, and have and have that um understanding. But um and I think this book is really for everyone, not just the youth. I just think it broke it down in layman terms of things that we see and deal with now with the youth. So it helps kind of explain things more. Uh, but anybody can actually relate to this book. I'm just glad that I finally was able to read it because it's a book that I want to hold because we hold um, different workshops and stuff with the parents um, uh, for like family night. And sometimes I lead some of those and I most definitely want to uh, incorporate this book into one of those um, those meetings that we have and actually put it on and, and do the actual audio and, and pick out certain chapters where I know that the parents relate because I know it will open up a, a really great, it will lead to a really great dialogue. Yeah, definitely. That would be a good idea. Diane, um, to expose this book to more people in your area that you, you know, that you're around on a, a regular basis for different groups that you're all in. 
Um, because it's definitely a a topic that needs to be had. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about in chapter four the spectrum of trauma. Um, a couple of things she stated was almost fifty percent of children in the U.S. have had at least one significant traumatic experience. Almost fifty percent. That's half of the children in the United States. <laughs> You know, and then 60% of American adults have had at least one adverse childhood experience, you know. So we're all in the same boat, basically. You know what I mean? Um, we've all been pretty much somebody has had trauma in their life, some form of trauma. You know, some is different, some is a little more worse than others. But like they all said, all pain is the same. You know, all pain is the same. So um, that was definitely um, an eye opener as well. And then she stated, because, because with, I mean, because if you got half of the children in the United States having a traumatic experience, that boils down to the, the things that they're dealing with in school, you know, like we stated before. Um, and no one knows what's going on with them. Um, and then they talked about the three E's, the trauma. Uh, the trauma has three key aspects the event, the experience, and the effect. And they stated that two people can have a traumatic experience, but it's all about how you go about experiencing it because they're going to, um, each person going to be different how they see it. They talked about an event where the firefighter, uh, the, the, there was a fire in the school and the firefighter, he came in and just put out the fire. The the uh, eighth, the fifth grader, you know, he was far away from the fire, so he didn't really experience the fire like that. He's thinking it's, oh, wow, it's a fire. Oh, my God. You know, it's a big thing to him. But then you got this little first grade or kindergarten. Now, they trauma, they they dealing with this trauma for the rest of their lives, basically. You know, I mean, it, they're all dealing with the same event, but everyone has different experiences is basically what they were talking about. Um. So yeah, that was one thing I wanted to point out. Um, what else? Um, oh, they talked about the girl Tyra. Remember her? The one that was in the hospital. How she was, her friend had gotten shot and all that. And she was in the hospital. And just the sound of the sirens kept making her um, sugar go up or whatever, you know. And no one could figure out. Maybe the doctor was like, well, it got to be, she, she's messing with the, she's messing with something. You know, she's doing this on her own. Something's going wrong. But no one could figure out because no one said and just even talked to her to say, well, what happened? You know, is, is it, what's going on with you? Did anything happen over the last week or so? Or just have a conversation with her. And that's when they detected that it was the sirens that was a triggering effect or evocative cue that was related to the ambulance when the, her, her friend had gotten shot. So that was um, dysregulating for her. And just by putting her in a different room of the hospital changed everything for her, you know? Um, that was like, wow, you know, just something like that. Even like you say to Michelle, just the smell of the guy with the old spice, you know, they talked about the smell of another child. They put um, the old clothes in front of the little boy of his foster, his foster father and the biological father. And he was in a coma at the time and made different reactions to each smell you know so like you stated just it, it's not just the memory of things happening that trigger us it's also the smell what we see um if you was abused by someone with a certain hair color the features you know and you see that person again and now you triggered and wherever you may be in a restaurant eating now you gotta run out the restaurant you know it could be all different things all type of your five senses can definitely trigger you at that moment in time yeah, um, with the hospital piece, I feel like that's why it's so important to have a, a multidisciplinary team because the medical, they're going to handle that medical piece. But as you can see, it wasn't the medical piece that she was dealing with. So all pieces can work together. And I think sometimes that's what, a, when we're in the hospitals, it's very hard for us to have a voice because medical trumps everything and as you see like he said medical mental affects medical medical affects mental we all if we all work together it all we are holistically taking care of 
an individual. And I think um, that's what, especially in them hospitals, it's very hard. I wouldn't, I, I can't do it. It's very hard for us to be in those hospitals working with uh, those nurses and doctors because they don't respect what we have to say. And as you can see, Dr. Perry was able to show them what the issue was by just, you know, assessing her and talking to her and figuring out what was going on and just instead of just accusing. They do that all the time, all the time. When that when I saw that, I was like, I wonder are they a person of color for them to automatically go to being accusatory. So are the doctors even aware that it goes together? Do they know that? Are they aware of that? Oh, it depends on it depends on uh it depends on the doctor. Is it depends on what they value, what they see value in. You know, it depends on the person. It's a personal type of thing. Some doctors great they work great with um you know with our field but other doctors may be like they don't see the point you in the way you 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 want to get to the heart where well, i'm trying to get to the heart so it just depends on the person you know we are i'm not gonna say all of them are disrespectful but sometimes it's very hard because they feel like when you're dealing with a medical piece you feel like that's life or death you know, you don't feel like when somebody mental mental health is affected that that's life or death, but it is. What yes. Is um. Uh, what did she say? I gotta go back to the chat. Facts. This part, you right. Oh, she said institutionally, it's not part of the curriculum or the cultural. Um, yeah, yeah kind of still like with the like it. Pick any of them, you know. It don't matter, and you know. Yeah, I think that's on purpose, but that's a whole nother conversation. But in the actual institutions, it's not how the people who are then going to carry out the service, mm -hmm. right? The service of humans are not being taught in these ways. I certainly wasn't, you know. And um, just looking at the pervasive culture and how folks are showing up, it don't seem to be the case. Um, and like you said, Michelle, the ones that are is because they've made a choice at some point and integrated this other, this more holistic idea of how you serve humans. And so they are different, but the institution certainly ain't rolling out folks. Like that's not a part of their classes as they're being um, certified and licensed along the way. And then now they're in this place and dependent on the other parts of who, who they are, um, are, are not dealing with their own biases that come, are not even aware of them. And so all that stuff is playing out and there's no no part of the curriculum that is checking it like, like it's being suggested here. And that's why I'm like, look, this could change the game in one generation. Yeah. Let's do this. You yes. know, listen, I've been preaching Dr. Perry for a long time. <laughs> Since I've heard of him, I'm like, man, if he can just infiltrate so many places, you know what this what this impact could do? Just like, man, he needs to be teaching people so they can so we can just have little pods everywhere. Uh, over. Yeah, I got chill bumps again. That's my yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Yeah, my suggestion, especially after this book, they should have definitely been known. And I and I, I would think doctors and you know dealing with the mental, dealing with a, a medical part, they should definitely work together. That should be a, a criteria. Like this, you go it go hand in hand. Once the doctor come in the room, you your vitals and figure out what your diagnosis is. Okay, boom. Next, here come the psychological therapist, doctor, whatever. Next, you know it's it's a it's a chain effect. For every patient, not just for certain ones. They do that. That's the thing. They do that. We're there, but it's not respected. Like that's we're the bottom. We're at the bottom. So the only reason Dr. Perry was called in because they couldn't figure it out. He was the last resort. Right. It's like just pretty. It's it's one of those things where it's just like um, what's the word I'm trying to use? Is it, Kind of like robotic, you know, okay, okay, well, we can't figure it out, pass it on to a mental, you know, institution, let them deal with it. And then they go on to the next person because it's, you know, it's, it's part of their proper protocol, but it's not 
the resolution of, okay, how can we work together? So they just pass it off, you know, okay, well, something's wrong with this person mentally, pass it off, you know, to a mental institution. Next. Let me say this, because even let's say his name didn't have DR. If he was just Bruce Perry, they might not listen to him. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. the difference. It's about a hierarchy. When you someone that's dealing with, like you a social worker, I have a clinical social work license. I probably had more, more schooling than some of these doctors, but because of how we are perceived, I don't have the knowledge. I had to sit under somebody for two years before I can even get sit for a test for a license to say, oh yeah, you could do this. I had to go to school for some years. Then I had to sit under somebody. After I came out from my master's program, I had to sit under somebody for two years before I could test for this clinical license. So when I say put some respect on my name, you're going to put some respect on my name. I don't know about nobody else. And that's the thing that we have to deal with all the time. Where if he was just Bruce Perry, he might not, they might have not listened to him either. But because he had a doc, a DR, that made it more impactful. Wow. Wow. Woo, girl. I know that's right, Michelle. Put some respect on your name. I know that's right. <laughs> Well, Sandra, when you come on here, you've been on here all the time. Yeah, I've been on here the whole time. I was driving. Oh, but I have been true? listening. Oh, huh? you don't have you know, this is your grandbabies? Yeah, them are my grandbabies. Oh, I didn't know who that was. <laughs> I thought that was somebody yeah, else. That's me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been listening and enjoying the conversation and, and it's like it's all so real. Um I was thinking about what Michelle was saying earlier about um, realizing why you act the way you act or do the things you do. Because for myself, I've been in therapy now since 21, since um, the pandemic and like really into it and trying to discover and realize things about myself so that I can be a better me for myself first and then for those around me. And recently I've had uh, revelations about some things and it's just like, wow. And I think just because I've been uh, focused on paying attention to myself and why I do certain things the way that I do them. And also uh, we were talking about like, um, you guys were talking about how kids can be raised in the same house, same family, same rules and the, the siblings can turn out so different. And that's so true. But I also feel like the village is so important. And that's something that we lost a long time ago. Like yes. some people are still strong in it. And I feel like, like I know a family that's like, they real strong and have a, a village, but I've never had that. I've never been a part of that village like that. And even um, to this day, it's like, sometimes I, I feel alone, like, I'm lonely in this world. And I'm like, you know, it's not meant for us to be by ourselves without mm. uh, feeling that care and that love and like the genuineness from people. So I think that's um, very important too, even for adults, not just for kids to have a village around them, surrounding them, guiding them. But uh, as adults, we need that as well. At least I feel like I do. And I want it. Um, Working with kids, like I'm, I'm at a new school this year. I transferred because I wanted to be closer to home. And I'm still with special need kids. And there's this uh, kid in my room. And I think it's so sad because a lot of grandparents are raising, their, raising these kids. And so there's no discipline. These grandparents, I'm talking about older grandparents who have no business trying to raise some kid with special needs or whatever, but it's a need. And this kid, um, he's only nine years old, but he's tall as I am. I'm five, six, and he is solid. And this kid smacked me in my chest twice one day last week, and he hit hard. And I had to catch myself, but I grabbed him, and I was about to sling this boy, but I had to remember, he's just a kid. You know what I mean? But I didn't sign up to be his punching bag, you know, and that they're, 
you're quick. They're quick to tell you, well, you signed up for this. No, this is not what I signed up for. You know, and they're quick also to say, well, you know, of course we have to extend grace to these kids because we don't know what they're dealing with at home, this, that, and the other. But you also don't know what I'm dealing with at home either. So just like these kids have triggers, the teachers have triggers too who are dealing with unruly kids who want to fight and be disrespectful. And like someone said, some, a student stabbed a teacher. Like this stuff is real. And I think um, this book, uh, yeah, it, it can be real helpful in a lot of situations or give you some new ways to think about things and how to think about handling things. And, and just to, you know, piggyback off of what you said, Michelle, that also, when you, when teachers go through that type of experience, that also can cause traumatic experience and PTSD for you guys as well. That's why sure. a lot of teachers are, are starting to resign because at the end of the day, yeah, you say I signed up for this, but I didn't sign up for this because I also want to feel safe. And when it becomes mm -hmm. to the point where I don't feel safe, then I can't do my job because now I'm looking over my shoulder. So how am I being helpful to anyone when I'm coming here in fear at this point? Yeah, I don't know. I mentioned it before, I think, in this uh, group um, at my other school that I left from. We had a student teacher there. They, they're doing their thing before they get their own classrooms. And uh, again, this was a a boy, he was actually being raised by his parents, but he used to like to karate kick you. He would just walk up to you and kick you. You don't have to do anything to him. That was just his thing. But mm -hmm. the student teacher, she was she was leading the class. This was her day to lead the class. And so she's uh, going around the class, asking the students this, that, pick this, whatever, whatever, whatever it was, the work. So she gets to this one student and she's asking him to, you know, pick, Pick your mood for the day or whatever. And he just, he didn't want to do it. And she was just trying to, you know, hey, which one? Just pick pick one or whatever. Man, this this boy, he slapped this teacher in the face so hard. Like, I'm saying he slapped the makeup off of her face. He slapped her so hard. Everybody, including the kids, was silent in the classroom after he slapped her. Like, everybody was in shock. And she couldn't do nothing but get up and walk out the classroom. Like, imagine that happening to you from a kid unprovoked. What do you do? Well, my thing is this. When those type of outbursts and, and violent uh, eruptions happen in school, there's no therapist on, on the call or there with the kids because, I mean, I would think that's where they need to go. Something wrong with them. So they don't just send them to the therapist or go sit in and talk to somebody? Are they not there every day? <laughs> um, the social worker that's usually at the school is not necessarily doing therapy or not. She will have all the kids then. But no, the ones that act oh, out, they all out? <laughs> The ones that beat on, on the teachers are the ones that need the therapy now one one right away. Forget the rest of them. I mean, you may be talking to somebody in the calm state, but the one that's over here beating up on people and karate kicking people and, and slamming and slapping teachers and stuff, they're the ones that need to the It doesn't work like that. Not in the real world. You know, you know how they do it, Tamara. Behavior, behavior. They Girl, please. <laughs> yeah, all, all the therapists come running and shit. About... They don't do that. Yours, they Girl. have people there to help, but they have calls as well. But I mean, no. honestly, most of these schools are understaffed because there's not enough hands on deck. Yeah. And okay, so when the, when the child... Go ahead, you're Tamara. looking at a non-for-profit organization, Tanisha. You're looking at where I was, where we, where I was working. <laughs> where behavior, I was working behavior. at, they had like behavior text, behavior analysts and things like that of that nature because it's, it's a whole different type of program than when you're at a school. A school, they do not barely can get one on one. Some of the, a lot of these kids have one on one, and you barely can get a one on one. So, so how do you think, and then 
a lot of the schools and are coming together and they don't even want police and things of that nature inside the school because they're saying that that's provoking and different things. So how you're going to have someone that come in and because sometimes when you have behavior analysts, they do study the, the person behavior, but also they're also trained to do restraints. And that's a whole nother thing in public school system. So when the child knocks the teacher down or slaps the mess out of her, then we just go back to learning whatever chapter seven. I mean, yeah, what? pretty much. Well, yeah, that's exactly no, what happens. I mean, no. part of the uh -uh. issue is that um, I mean, it's only one social worker to maybe two or three schools. Oh no! Oh, so you got to think about if you got four or five hundred kids in one school. This social worker might not have been there on staff and they're not, they're not miracle workers. Like they're not the whisper of stopping the kids from uh, doing things that takes time. That takes, you know, even Dr. Perry couldn't go right. in and just solve issues. It took, it took him building relationships with yeah. them to be able to get them to regulate and do certain things. So that's part of the issue where, I don't know how, I, like when I was uh, doing an after school program, I kind of taught like, uh, I tried to bring in the curriculum of uh, social emotional uh, to get kids mm -hmm. to learn how to learn coping skills, to learn how to really tap into when they're feeling a certain way. Why are you feeling this way? So they don't react because everybody goes to anger. If you're sad, you go to anger. If you are feeling scared you go to anger so anger is always the quick readily emotion that most of us as humans do we go to that emotion because it's easier it's quicker to as we see now it's the brain the lower the uh lower part of the brain that is activated that's making us go to that anger piece so I think it's just really trying to build relationships. And part of the reason why these teachers can't do that because they have to teach to the test. They can't take and develop each individual kid because like they said, they're overstaffed, they're overwhelmed. And some of them don't even have the tools to do that. So the, it's just a, it's just a cycle and it's this this is kind of just with these two teachers that's on that we're listening that we're talking to that maybe some of this can filter out and we can start making changes but it's just hard because like they say it's a system this is systematic where we're dealing with our kids that nobody nobody cares as far as at the top i ain't talking about just us at the baseline but that's part of the issue there is no vested interest. What's the vested interest? The vested interest is to have the prison, the school, the pipeline. That's the vested interest. Where when that kid gets to third grade, we know how many kids going to be in the jail, in the penal system because, mm -hmm. of, because they have these type of outbursts. This boy didn't smack the taste out of a teacher's mouth. How you think he gonna be viewed at that school? How you think they're going to deal with him at that school? Because now we can't trust. We don't know what you gonna do. We literally trying to teach a class that you didn't hit us. Mm -hmm. But we don't even know what was the reason. What was the reason? Right. What triggered him to do that? And then not only that, the kids. Because you, now you're being disruptive in a class. The, the teacher, you know, is also fearful for her lot, you know, but now you have kids that seen this, which that could, sh could shake up some of the kids as well and cause trauma for some because now I'm scared of him. Exactly. He didn't put his hand on this teacher. I know he'll put his hand on me. I can't even function because I don't know what he's going to, and he constantly having these outbursts. That's keeping me from learning. And it's funny because whenever these kids do these things, the first question they'll ask you is, well, what happened? Like, what provoked him? What motivated him to do that? So one day in a class last week, 
the kids sitting at their desk, the, the lead teacher is up front leading with his instruction, sitting there um, doing the work on the computer. And this boy just jumped up out of his seat and ran over there and started attacking the teacher. So it's like it's not like anybody said anything to him or looked at him any any way. He just popped up out of his chair and went over there trying to, you know, hit on the, the lead teacher in the classroom. And it's like sometimes it doesn't take anything to provoke them that we see. I don't know if he's sitting there and what he has going on inside his head and his mind, but sometimes they just get up and do what they do. On an impulse, Maybe. impulsive behavior. You know, you right. never know. You never see it coming. They just, they just do exactly. it. Exactly. And they do also um, have a re get a reaction from some of the other kids because they see him misbehaving or, you know, he's now having to try and be restrained. So it triggers another kid who we don't know what he's dealing with at home. So now he's screaming out loud or, you know, yeah. just, you know, so it's like um, domino effect. Right, 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 right. And, and that's draining especially if you have to deal with that constantly day in and day out. And that's why a lot of these teachers, they are walking away or they like, I, give me a, a, a younger current, um, grade or I go to the older kids. And then, I mean, they act out in every grade, every level, but it's either they doing that or they transfer to different schools or they like this, I can't do this anymore. Because again, it's a domino effect. Now this is going to mess up my household. You know, because this is messing up my mood and everything. And it's, it's just sad because now this is where the shortage comes in at. And they seem to be high in and everybody. Not everybody that's teaching is meant to be a teacher. They're there just for a paycheck. True. The way that's I hear some true. of these teachers talking to these kids, I'm like, how is she teaching anything when it's all I hear every time I walk past your classroom is yelling? Oh, yeah, I was going to say that. I know I've worked around. Well, growing up that. in here, I got mine. So you better try to get yours, right? Right. Yeah. That's that's mm -hmm. an awful, awful philosophy for a teacher to say to a student. But I think it takes a teacher getting real frustrated to say that. Yeah, when, usually. Yeah. You know, yeah. because you're trying to teach and you have some kids there that's trying to learn, but you have some kids there that they're there because they're forced to be there you know it's rough so i at my other school that i left um i was talking to someone there and they told me that i, I think it was an eighth grader had transferred in but they had recently found out that this eighth grader had gang ties had recently been shot whatever whatever and so the principal there, she don't play that much. She got him up out of that school and sent him to his home school because don't bring that drama to this door or whatever. Wow. Nobody wants to be scared and fearful because you have these affiliations and you might bring that activity here. So this isn't your home school, so you can go to your home school. And I think that's fair because who wants to be at work where you have to worry about something like that? It's already scary and unsafe out here. Like nowhere you go, you can actually feel safe. But when it's a case where you can help a little bit with the feeling of safety, then you got to do what you have to do. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about what um, Michelle mentioned about prison, the pipeline. Um, she stated, uh, Dr. Perry stated, more children are expelled from school in pre-K than at any other grade level. Children yep. of color, especially boys of color, are expelled at rates three times higher than white children. Yes. Yep. Now, I didn't even know pre-K you was even getting expelled. I didn't know that yes, was even thing. Yes. Oh, that's where it started, honey. Yes, it is. It is. They can't bite. They can't. They can't do none of that. You got kids that's biters. Yes. That's, that's uh throwing them tantrum that you can't control. Yes, they get rid of those kids. And in pre-K. Yeah, because they, but, they, look, they, at, they, but they, they, look at it from the lens of what we just learned. If you got a kid that's a biter at three, 
or they're throwing tantrums that like dysregulating at three years old, like looking at it from the lens of this book is showing you like what's going on, what's happening. Cause mm -hmm. something is happening while this kid is dysregulating like this in school at three. At three. At three. And Can't I, even probably spell his name, but yeah, at three, at he's three. standing up the entire classroom yeah. every every day. I had a little boy on Friday that I was substituting at another school um, for an after school program, and I said, "Amaria, oh, why do you? What is this around your neck?" It was a little rubber thing, and then he put it in his mouth. I said, "Ew, don't put that in your mouth. That's 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 nasty. That's germs." I said, "Why are you biting on that?" And he put, took it out of his mouth and he's in kindergarten. He looked at me, he said, because I bite people. And I'm looking at him. I said, oh, okay. Well, put it back in your mouth then. And so I go to the other people that are normally there. And I said, so Omaria has a problem with biting um, kids because he's, they have that around his neck because he said he bite people. And they looking at me and these are young um, high schools. And they said, oh, is that what he told you? Also, you all didn't know this. Okay. Well, that's why he has it around his neck. Some of the social workers in school have given kids those, and I've seen it because um, I had a student. He didn't used to bite others, but he used to bite himself so much in one spot on his arm. He just had this, it looked like a big, it's just a permanent scar there where he just, basically chews on himself so she gave him a thing he put it around his neck and it's this you know instead of biting on yourself when you have the impulse to bite yourself just bite on this whatever it is and it did help to take down the number of times at least in school where he was biting on himself he'll just use that tool that was given to him by the social worker or whoever it was that gave it to him at school as an alternative to biting on himself because yeah, the scar, it was just, it's just huge. And it's, it's not, it's never going anywhere. It's there. But and this is where of students like that. This is where I get confused because even with reading Oprah book, the whole discipline thing, even my daughter said to me yesterday, um, she grew up in Hansdale. So it's a little bit different, right? Out here and how they think of things. Any Anything she sees, she says abuse. If you say, <laughs> if, if, if you tell a kid, if you do that again, you're going to be in trouble. I'm going to get you. She'll say that's abuse, right? Because living out here, they're taught that everything is abuse, basically. Well, I'm over-exaggerating. Look, just a little bit. So this is where I get confused where I get a little bit confused or it's hard to answer because I'm not saying that spankings and things like that is necessary, but I don't think, I don't think nothing is wrong with it if that's what a kid needs, right? And then I feel like when a kid go to school and they're all out of control and then the person or you hear the comment like, oh, their parents didn't do this or their parents didn't do that. And it's so hard. It's 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 like a borderline. What what do you do? Because if I discipline my child for some things, I'm not saying for those things that we're talking about now, but just say their behavior is just out of control. You have spoken with them, you have did all types of options, but now you're like, okay, when you, I'm going to, I'm going to get you, as, you know, we'll say, some people will say, but then now it's considered, if you discipline your child, and, you're, and your child is told, it's abuse. Corporal, I, punishment, I, I, is, corporal punishment is allowed, it's not, you can't leave marks or bruises. Right. That's really? I was gonna no. say I'm not against discipline. I'm against yeah. Corporal punishment is allowed. Even even if you get a case called on you when they come out, it's if they have marks or bruises. 
anybody can make a case, you know, can call in on you and say abuse, but that don't mean that it actually is. But I have had cases that that won. Not not me per se, but like I told you, well, I'm not supposed to have certain conversations, but I have seen where I I know it's made up. And and it's not my job to say whether I know it's made up or it's accurate. I, I have to state exactly what is stated to me. You can't take away, you can't add. And then you'll hear that same person a week later adding and subtracting and say things like, well, you know, I was upset. You made me upset and I did blah, blah, blah. So there are times where you don't necessarily have to have a group. So they were taking out the home or they just was a report was made on them? A report was made and it, it's it's a lot behind a report because I am that person at one point that, you know, I have to be very careful what I say because, we you know, everything is supposed to be confidential where I'm not supposed to discuss. But reports have been made and and yeah, that person, life is on the line. When I say life, because it's your livelihood. If you are, if there's enough information to say that you did this or they feel that it's accurate, then yeah, your life is on, that's your livelihood. Right. I get what you're saying. It's very, sub, uh, like, it's very subjective. Is very subjective. subjective. Like you said, somebody, I may come into the home and may talk to the bio mom versus somebody else going to home and talk to the bio mom. It's going to be totally different ways that we interpret that. Exactly. So, so like I just, like I said previously, anybody can make a report. I can make a report on any of y'all. That don't mean it's going to be found. It got to go before a judge. Like nobody's just going to come in and take the kids out the home. It's, it got to go through channels. Yes. Is it bad? I've had cases where when I was an investigator, I knew this case was bogus, but I still got to go out and investigate it because it may be that one time it ain't bogus. Exactly. So but I, 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 I'm mm -hmm, go ahead. Mm -mm. No, no, no. But I have seen where it's like, it was stated like, I'm going to get this person in trouble and blah 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 you know yes we have all that like especially when they going through custody when you got parents going through custody issues they're going to go back and forth back and forth with making uh reports so but we get my, clogged down you get clogged down with the system where now they you people got to go out on these bogus reports and do all these things because people want to make reports i mean it's it's a flawed system but my thing is so i'm gonna go back to the my my point is where I know you all saying that if, if you don't have any bruises or things like that, but I believe a lot, some of these kids are out of control because there's no discipline to their other issues, right? Each case is different, but there, there are some cases where there's no discipline. There are, you know, I, I had somebody say to me the other day, like, well, my child said to me, if you do blah, 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 then I can call this number. And the fear of having your kids being taken off the, out the home, say not that kid, but you have two other kids, then it's, it's just like, it's so much where, you know, even with Oprah Book, I, I would understand. like to, to me, when you got a kid that's threatened you as a parent, they lost them a long time ago. They haven't had that discipline in place previously. So that's sometimes what the issue is where the discipline may not come in place. And then when they get older, when they can have an opinion, they start saying it because the discipline may not have been in place for them. Okay. And that discipline could be whatever whatever that parent chooses as discipline. It could be corporal punishment. It could be taking things away. It could be whatever that's effective because corporal punishment ain't truly effective either. You're right. Yeah. 
Because if it was, we wouldn't. Ha- I wouldn't have people in my generation where they are in jail or not productive citizens. You have parents that discipline their kids when when I was growing up, and they still turn out b a d a s s. <laughs> so you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's it's a combination of things. It's discipline. It's love, it's the environment, it's just a lot where we dealing with, we're, we live in the inner city of Chicago where they got multitudes of factors to just get to school, to grow up. So, you know, that's, I that mean, I, so know, I ain't gonna say corporal punishment. Like when I was growing up, I used to be like, when I was thinking of having kids, I was like, yeah, I'm a, I believe in corporal punishment. Do I necessarily believe in it now? I don't know. It, I mean, I think it's a time and place. I don't think that should be your first form of discipline for children. I agree, but I, I don't think it should be a threat neither. It shouldn't be like, oh, if you do this, if you discipline your child this way, then, you know, we'll take them out the home or things like right, that. And now it becomes this whole thing where everybody is saying, oh, you know, you're beating your kids if you do this. And you beating them if you're doing that. I'm like, no, that's not that's not I true. Think that's but, a yeah. lot of misinformation. I think yes, could you possibly have a report if you do hit your kids? Absolutely, but that doesn't mean that it's going to go any further. But do somebody want to have somebody coming into their home dissecting what they do as a parent? No, but that's that's the. The consequences and you know that you have to deal with that 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 is tragic with that. Mm-hmm. Does that help you at all, Tamara? What Michelle's response? I don't think she wanted help. I think she just wanted to vent. <laughs> no, no, no. It did, I mean, that's what she gave me some insight. Um, oh, okay. it, it did. Yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. I thought you just wanted to kind of like you know. I mean, I did want to just bring that out, mm-hmm. but also with me bringing that out, you gave a little spin to it, so it was some insight there. So okay. yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> what um, do you do, camera? I'm sorry. I, what do you do? I just switched over, so. Um, uh, I have been in social services for a very long time for uh twenty four years, but now I just took over a new role um doing like assistive technology. So oh. this is very new. This is really out of my field. Um, I I was I was a little drained, if you could say. I'm trying to say the correct words. Burn out. And just say it, honey, because we all know what you, where you're going with it. Just say I'm it. Burn out. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> burn out. <laughs> well, you so, burn out, honey. Yeah, you, <laughs> you, know, I, I, I was, like you good. <laughs> I was doing the crisis call. Uh, the last yeah, when you said crisis call, I was like, what is her self-care? I'm going to tell you immediately, when you said she was doing a crisis call, all that first thing that popped in my head was like, what is she doing for her self care? Because she got yes. to do something. Yes. For her if you getting inundated with that type of information, baby, you have to so, be strict. I oh. I was praying for God to relieve me of that. I finally got a new position in April. I think it was like April 9th. and I thank God every day, but. Yeah. Yeah. It was especially during the pandemic. And you you can't go outside and you getting these calls twenty four hours a day. It's nonstop. Yeah. Um yeah, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna I say can yeah. only imagine that is a very it's draining. Yes. I have a friend that like something like Friday, I came home and I just went straight to sleep. And I don't deal with kids to that magnitude like you guys do. But just dealing and working with kids, period. And I work with all grades and all ages. Uh, and I, my friend, I was telling my friend, I was like, girl, I was tired because she called me and I didn't hear the phone. 
I said, sometimes I get home, I, I, I don't even eat dinner. All I want to do is take a shower, get in the bed, and go to sleep. I'm mm-hmm. like, I am mentally drained because, you know, I'm talking all day. I'm trying to discipline all day. I'm moving around. I got a crazy schedule. So something, she's like, oh, you probably just need to take a vitamin B12 shot. No, 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 that ain't it. <laughs> so not. That is not it. I said, I'm physically, I have to physically be available from 5, 30, well, 6 o'clock in the morning to almost 7 o'clock at night. That's a lot of hours and a lot of energy that I have to be put out. So when I get home, I'm drained. Yeah. So I can only imagine like teachers that teach in an actual physical classroom all day. I personally couldn't do it. I teach more on the enrichment side and just creating um, a way to try to get kids to open up on that uh, more on a social and emotional level. And that can be a little draining, but I, I have found ways to try to make it very engaging and fun and active. But uh, actual teachers and social workers, you guys, my head goes off to you all because this is something you all deal with every day. And, you, and so as much as you give, out to those kids, somebody has to give it back to you. Oh yes, you yeah. preaching. I don't do that. I don't um I don't work with kids anymore. And um so I do the medical insurance piece, uh like case management, and I do private practice therapy, and I don't really even take on kids. <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> Yeah, so um, I don't. I don't really have a stress. My job, like what I do now, I'm not stressed. I don't have any high stress with my job now, and I kind of like have created that where it's not really stressful. Stressful, really. yeah, yeah. And I love what I do actually, but it's still draining because yeah. I'm still putting out a lot with kids. But I love it. But it, and my thing is, okay, how much longer am I gonna be able to do this? Or am I going to flip it around and try to do something else? But you can only, I think, because, you know, we're all human. You can only take this for so long. And that's, that's and why I see of, teachers I think sign. part of what the issue is, a lot of us is not practicing self-care. You got to pour back. Absolutely. You got to do something to pour back in you because they're taken. You got people that's vampires that's taken from you. So if you got somebody draining you, how are you filling it up? And that's part of what we're not we're not really doing is that self-care piece and self-care doesn't necessarily mean going out on a shopping spree it just may be whatever it is to get you back to the baseline to do this type of work absolutely i have a friend that wrote a book and maybe i we can bring her in as it you know once it gets cold we're going to be inside more she wrote a book and she was all she's a school teacher actually her book is called excuse me self-care is more than a manicure yeah yeah and it's a deep and it's deep and and not to play devil advocate but how do you have self-care say i'll just go back to the role that i was in as with the crisis call right Mm -hmm. that that role was 24 hours a day it wasn't your nine to five it wasn't no eight hours so what you don't call huh the thing is, what you pro- did you have a therapist? I ended up. <laughs> I'm laughing now. I ended that up getting part. one during the pandemic because I was like, I'm gonna lose my yeah. mind up. In yes, here. that could be your self care. Like it's a it's something that you. The thing is with you and that crisis line, y'all all should have therapists. Y'all yes all should have therapists. It's, that should be something that they're paying for. That's yes. mandatory. <laughs> Because God you relieve me of that. Vicariously trauma. Every every day you live having vicarious trauma come to you. A secondary trauma come to you every single day. How that means just like we're talking about with the brain. So sometimes y'all, what like Diane says, she shut down. People don't realize when they, they shut down because your brain is so tired, it can't function no more. That was me. That was me every Best day. Thing you do is go to sleep. I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. And we and, don't even realize. Yeah. I didn't even realize that until she said it. I'm like, man, when I go back to my past, I literally will come home. Sometimes I didn't want to talk to nobody. I didn't want to be. On- I just want to go to sleep. And sometimes we do it where we emotionally eat or we sit in front of the TV 
and just veg out and just be. I didn't want to go nowhere because yeah. I began to have anxiety because I was thinking like, okay, yes. when the next call going to come in? Yes. Okay. It's getting ready to come in. It's too quiet. It's too yep. quiet. I know I'm going to get a call. Okay. I better not go to the store because a call is going to come in. But you know, oh, oh God, I don't even want to relive that. Look, that's good. caused you to have PTSD. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. God relieved me of that. So I ain't going to even go back down memory lane on that. Mm -hmm. Woo, thank you, Jesus. But it's good to talk about it because you can help other people. Yeah. No, no, no. That's You're right. But mm -hmm. yeah, it brings me stress thinking about it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can be a vessel to help other people that's still in your shoes and haven't gotten out yet. Yeah. So definitely use your voice piece sure. for that. They definitely. all need therapy. Y'all got that's EAP. Your, that's it. Everybody got EAP programs. You working for a company, you got an EAP program where they at least pay, they at least give you a few sessions to go to a therapist. Yeah, I forgot all about EAP actually. Yeah. It's a great way to introduce people to therapy because everybody that is not comfortable with going to therapy. Right, right. And that's a great way where you can really, um, you know, see how see how you vibe with the person. You don't, you know, and see if it's something you could do. But I, especially in some of these industries, um, they definitely need to have some them that be something mandatory that. Like when cops, like when cops shoot somebody, they have to mandatory go to these therapists or things like that. Where it's like when you're dealing with this type of trauma, you do need somebody that can assist you. And most people be like, well, I'll just go to my friends. Where, like, and with Dr. Perry, he's saying it has to be a community. It has to be some kind of way that um you get in that connection to, mm -hmm. you know, to get to that resilience. Yes. And it could be a friend. He did say that. Yeah, he said he it don't necessarily have to be a, 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 a therapist. It can be a friend as long as you trust that person and yeah. it's fulfilling whatever it is that you're trying to fulfill. It is okay. Right. Yeah. The pandemic, I think, have opened up our eyes to that because a lot of the whole um mental a lot of people the suicide all of those different things my job has even incorporated well we have a young lady oh my gosh she's so good her name is dr sims who has came and spoke at our company a few times and she's so deep because she even me like i said i probably wouldn't have went through no therapy but i was going through with the crisis call and then being on you know the crisis call and then having um being going the crisis call and then also going through the pandemic it had began to be a lot i probably would have never went through any therapy any counseling because in our community we're told <laughs> just to pray about it there's nothing impossible for god we're not told that it's okay to have therapy or counseling because you're considered crazy but now with everything that's going on it's acceptable in society and it's okay now so I think now a lot of people are getting therapy, but at one time it was like a no-no. Like, yeah. you're crazy. So, My honest opinion, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. I just believe that everybody can benefit from therapy. I don't care if you feel like you need it or not. I think <laughs> it's beneficial to everybody. Yes. But a lot of people are just not open to it, even still. Yeah. yeah, and I'm glad and then I did. finding the right therapist is key, also because mm -hmm. just because they're That's a therapist, the don't mean they're the right therapist for you. Because right. I recently let go of a therapist because I didn't feel like he was beneficial to me. Like he wasn't serving me in a way that I needed it. So I told him we I didn't want his services anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. I just hate I waited so late to even. Because even when my doctor told me about it, I was like, I'm not crazy. I hear somebody. Right, I can't hear them all the way. Yeah, that was muffled. I don't know who it was. Yeah, but I'm glad. I think it was Rachel. She just oh. joined us. Hey, Rachel, how you doing? How you ladies doing? Hey, how are you? 
Um, well, well, this is her first time coming on book club as well. Okay. Uh, do you have background in your in your area? Background noise? Probably by fan. And I'm watching my uh, grandma watching TV, watching a movie. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, because we can hear a little noise in the background. So if you oh, can mute your phone until you have something to say, that would be great, please. Absolutely, ladies. Thank you. You're welcome, on. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. I was just saying that. I think that was just like the best thing I hate. It took me so long. I probably could have been better in so many ways, even in my own life, my parenting skills and just therapy brought so many things out that I didn't even know that was there. And to only have like a few minutes of stuff that has happened in your past and you don't realize how it has overflown and just in your future, you still carry in baggage. And um, I just wish I could have had that so long ago. I, it was the pandemic and being on that crisis call where I was like, I'm going crazy. Like, I was really worried about my health. Like, I was like, I don't know. And my doctor was so worried that she assigned me, uh, well, she told me about a therapist at the, at the um, hospital. And I think that was the best thing. But at first I was like throwing her off for a long time. Like, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not crazy. But yeah, I, I think it could have helped me in so many ways, but yeah, I mean, you can't go back. You could just move forward and try to make the best of it. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> I just want to pinpoint two things. Well, I wanted to let Rachelle talk because I know you just got on, sweetie. So can you um give us your view of anything that you wanted to share with us while you while you just got on? Anything about the book? Anything? Just give us some some of your um sharing some comments with us. First of all, good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. Good um, I didn't get a chance to fully finish the book, but I did read enough of it to where um, I can't remember the exact chapter, but it it's one particular chapter that was like a real trigger for me because I've always been the type of person that when I'm a when I say I'm a friend. I'm really a friend. And when I was going through my storm, all the people that I helped, they wasn't there for me. And <clears throat> before I went through my storm, my mother-in-law had told me, she said, baby, you look over there to the corner and you're going to see who's going to be there for you. And I always remember when I looked, to that corner, it was my son. And I always keep that in mind with me because <clears throat> when Oprah was talking about the um, issues that she was having with her mom and I was like thinking about the triggers with me when I had, like I said, I had been there for people and when I was going through my storm I had lost my let me give a little background of my storm I had lost my mom and my husband three months apart and I didn't grieve for my mom and my husband I kind of just pushed it to the side and when I did realize that you know you didn't grieve for them properly I was really depressed and I didn't know I was depressed. I was a functioning person that was depressed. And when I realized that, I I started to heal, but it took me a long time to heal. And it took me a long time to forgive the people who had Did she drop out? 
Yeah, that's yeah I think her phone thing. dropped out. That's how I be with signals and stuff. But before, why she come back on? I'm gonna. Oh, there she go. Go ahead. Log her back in. Okay. I'm sorry, ladies. I got a call and I was trying to ignore the call, but I end up answering it. So it took me some years to heal to where I was able to realize that before I can love and help others, I had to love and help myself. And once I did that, I realized I don't have to say yes to everybody. It's okay to say no. It's okay to if you it's okay if you're not liked. It, it's okay if everyone is not in your corner. As long as you have those true friends and that true support. I'm sorry. Come on. I'm sorry. Um, as long as you have that, that true, as I like to say, the village you would be okay. So the book was very opening to me and it helped me deal with, like I said, some triggers that I would think about. I would like think about, I didn't need them to help me financially. All I really wanted was him to say, it's going to be okay. You got this. And I never got that. And to this day, I'm not friends with them. They tried They tried to come back across the bridge, but I'm just over it. So I, that's all I had to say, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that, Rachel. And once again, I'm so happy you finally joined us. Thank you so much for coming. Um, welcome. And being transparent about your own story. I really appreciate that as well. Um, welcome. You're welcome. Um, I'm so glad that this book has helped seem like, of course, all of us, you know, in some way or face, shape or form. Um, I just wanted to pin back on what Tamara, uh, what Tamara was saying about the church and how we always connected with the church. And that's what Oprah said as well on, um, in chapter eight, she, she basically stated, um, in those days, the church was everything. It was your counselor, your nurturer, your comforter, your refuge. The idea of going to a therapy or going to a therapist wasn't even discussed. If you needed help, you went to church. So I just wanted to, you know, add on to that because church was where where we went to you know we didn't have no therapy like you said therapy was for people that was just over the threshold who was just crazy and you know so that was not what we were used to so that's why our parents and their generation before us we didn't talk about therapy therapy is something that's once again relatively new you know um so yeah I, I just wanted to bring that out and then also I wanted to talk about um the um uh, the statistics far as um, in the media that Oprah was talking about um, in the same chapter as well about when um, black men and black youth in movies are on TV, you know, we're portrayed as, you know, how we are portrayed as um, being uh, malicious. And she stated that in um, Isabel Wilkerson's book, uh, Cass, she quotes a study from a criminal justice reform organization called the Sentencing Project. They found that crimes involving a black suspect and a white victim make up only 10% of all crimes, but they account for 42% of what's reported on television. So once again, it's all about, you know, it, media has a big influence on what people think of us as black Americans. You know, um, lot, some people don't even have any black friends. They say they do, but not really. They not having them over for dinner. They not going on no trip. They ain't calling them on no phone. Some people ain't even got a black person in their phone and they in their contact. But they say, oh, you know, I'm friends with black people. No, you just know by passing and who you see and you saw them one time at a at a barbecue and 
Oh, we friends. No, you know. Oh, I saw, I see the lady at the grocery store. No, no, no. You know what I mean? So um, media has a big uh, portrayal of what people think of us. And like you said, Michelle, with the police um, going to some type of therapy, um, teaching them about, um, you know, how to deal with us without shooting us as soon as something happened. My thing is also, you say that going afterwards, I think they should go before, you know, before and after, you know, um, don't wait till somebody die and go to therapy. No, you need to be doing this every day. This needs to be a class. It needs to be an ongoing thing, you know, not just when you um becoming a police, but something that's a ongoing to, to remind you, you know, it, it, it needs to be incorporated in their, in their organization. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to add that. But um, this was a very good discussion. Again, I'm glad that we did come on here and you all, you know, took the time out of your busy day to come on and share your thoughts and share your comments. Because like I say, what you say on today can definitely inspire and help somebody else um, that may be going through what you're going through. So that's why one thing I do like about us, we um, this is a safe space to share information and to be transparent. And the overall uh, result is, you know, to help someone else. That's what it's all about. Um, did anyone else have anything to share? Anybody else? It doesn't matter. Just anybody have any else, anything to share before we go? I'm glad you had this uh, special, you know, Zoom, because this is something that's kind of near and dear to me. This is, you know this is the work that I take pride in. I, I love um, talking about um, these type of things. And as you see, it, it can, uh, it touches on every aspect of people. Like it ain't just the social worker. It's not just a teacher. It's what you do, Tanisha. It's what multiple people, whoever may listen to this recording just by chance, they, this might touch them with us having this discussion. And I think it was a very good discussion where we, I think we all kind of learned something from this book and from each other from having this discussion today. I, I mean, I I feel good. I'm glad. I mean, it went over the time. Well, usually we do two hours, but I think it went so fast because it was such a wonderful topic to kind of like tap into that. We just had to kind of let it flow, I think. Yeah. yeah and so I also very, just want to mention to Rachel and just to anybody that depression shows up different for Black women. I want us to know that, that it shows up different from us. It's not going to show up where we laying in the bed, can't get out the bed. That's not how it's going to show up most of the time for Black women. It show up for us differently because of just how we are socialized and culturalized. It's just not going to be, that's a, that's usually the uh, white people, white women. Uh, that's how it shows up for them for depression where they can't get out the bed. We may be highly functioning. We may be doing everything, but still may be depressed. It shows up in other ways. It may show up in just how we're quick to snap at someone so it just shows up different ways and i and sometimes we don't even we don't have that awareness that we may be dealing with some mental health um concerns I and it can go for a long time mm -hmm. it, it does because i lost my husband and my mom 20 actually this year will be 20 years since they passed away and i literally just started to heal two years ago. I started that journey two years ago. And I agree with you, Michelle. It's definitely totally different because I would never, I didn't, I wouldn't lay in bed and be like, I couldn't get out of bed. I would get up, I would go to work, I would be a mom to my son. And I would just deal with life. Yeah. And I would I would break down in the midnight hours. Yes. When 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 I would have those that a long time. Mm -hmm. And I always say in the midnight hour, your mind idles. 
man don't it that's when you know something is wrong when you laying down to go to sleep that is when you know something is going on with you that's usually when it shows up and it it was so bad Mm -hmm. that i would drink i mean i when i when i say i would drink i would drink and one day my oldest son he, at the time he was my only child um cuz like i said i i really been dealing with a lot i lost uh, my middle child i didn't grieve for him i still grieve for him are you in therapy I'm not, but I have considered going because you really get with somebody so that much. deals with trauma, like not trauma with grief. You really need to get with a therapist that's trained in grief because you need to process um this. You need to process because you've had very significant deaths. Yes. And those are and it's manifesting in some kind of way. That's what people don't realize. One thing about mental health, it's going to manifest some type of way. And so with that, yeah. and a lot of times we as Black people, we don't know how to grieve. We don't know I- how to process that grief because we're not taught that we can have emotions. Absolutely. I'm I always be the strong one for my friends. I know. And I always say, who's going to be there for the strong one? I always say that. I always say, who there for Rachel? Mm-hmm. And, you know, they say, well, oh, you go to your family. I don't feel comfortable going with to my family with my problems because I came in on the the end of it, but I definitely know what kind of can get a clue what you ladies are speaking on. You we was told, you know, to chuck it up and deal with it. Yes. You know, yes. It, it you you not allowed to sit and sit down and, and you gotta and be cry. strong. Right. So, Rachel, we talked, but we also talked about with the mental health, it's going to show up medically. A lot of times us as black people, that's why we we have heart, we have heart uh, disease. We have high blood pressure, high cholesterol. It's going to show up medically when you're dealing, when you're not dealing with that mental piece. Right. Mm. Right. And I, like I said, I didn't. I didn't deal with it until, like I said, two years ago. I I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't talk about my son passing. I wouldn't talk about my mom. I wouldn't talk about my husband. Me and my oldest son, we we just would not talk about it. Yeah. And like I said, these last two years, we really connected to where the, our relationship is so beautiful that when I think about it, I don't cry, but I smile because it's like what my mother-in-law had always told me, that that he was going to always be that one. And he has always been that one. I don't care what I'm going through, how I'm feeling, if I'm wrong, he'll sit, he's gonna listen. And eventually he'll come back and tell me, hey mama, you know you was wrong, but I gotta let you get that off because you have held in so much for so long and you need to get that off your chest. Take care, uh, Lissandra. All right, bye, ladies. I just wanted to add, bye bye. I just wanted to add that um, about what you all were talking about, what trauma can affect. Um, on page two nineteen, it says trauma can impact our genes, our white blood cells, our heart, gut, lungs, our brain, our thinking, feeling, behaving, parenting, teaching, coaching, 
consuming, creating, prescribing, arresting, and sentencing. Sentencing, and they can go on and on. But trauma affects a lot of things and it impacts a lot of things with our health and everything and at every aspect. So, um, but um, the last chapter is basically on healing, you know, and they stated that we all are healers. This conversation today was a healing, was a form of healing, you know, for everyone. Like Rachelle stated, she doesn't, she don't really talk about this. This is her first time ever coming on this uh, book club um, discussion, ever meeting us, and she was very, um, you know, uh, transparent in how she spoke with us, you know, and telling us some things that she's been dealing with, you know, and it's every time you talk about it, it's healing somebody, trust mm -hmm. and believe this, you know, every, we all going through something and somebody is definitely going through the same thing you're going, even what you said, Michelle, telling her how to go to a grief therapist, that's healing to us because somebody is definitely in this, on this session right here is dealing with grief. You know, and we don't think about going to a specialist, a grief therapist or whatever, you know, because like y'all, you have said, we all talk to keep it, you know, be strong and keep moving and, you know, hey, mm -hmm. pray about it and keep going. So everything someone has said today has definitely touched and helped someone. You don't even know it and you won't ever, ever know it. But trust me, it's definitely helping somebody. So, um Thank you all for joining us today. We'll be having our next Zoom the end of this month, and we'll have a um a author will be on with us, and we'll be discussing her book. And just make sure you have your questions ready. You don't have to have a lot of questions; just you know, maybe one question or so. It doesn't matter, but just have your questions ready for her. And um, we definitely will be reading another one of Bruce Perry's book. Michelle, you only told me about the one that raised the dog. So maybe I'll go on there and find some more books. So if you want to recommend some more of his books, that'd be good too. Or if you have anything else. Only, this uh raise the dog was the only one I've read. That was that's part of our that was part of our curriculum and uh in school. So that's how I know about it. But I, I don't know of any I can look. Yeah, please. If you find something else, let us know. We already got rate um how to raise the dog on the list. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for recommending her book. She na named the book um, Kill Them Before They Grow. Uh, that's on Amazon, so we're going to look that up. And then Lysandra, uh, I mean, was that, that was that Lysandra? No, Diane. Yeah. Diane recommended a book her friend wrote, Self-Care is More Than a Manicure. So thank you all for those recommendations. I will be looking into those books as well. All right. So you all, thank you all for being patient. I know like Michelle said, it went a little longer because we don't normally be two, over two hours, but this was necessary. Um, what needed to be said today was definitely important and essential. So um, you all have enjoy the rest of your uh, Sunday and have a good holiday. Labor Day is tomorrow. Enjoy, eat good, enjoy the weather. It's going to be 90 something in Illinois. <laughs> And I will definitely see you all at the end of this month. All right? All right. See y'all, ladies. Thank you. Bye, Bye, ladies. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.